Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Olga Dmitrieva. I'm a graduate student from the university across the street, I think this way. So it's Colorado University at Boulder. I'm also an employee of Colescence. Um, Enrique just gave a perfect example of the studies we deal with. So I will be concluding this session today on the exciting and controversial subject of the cold fusion with um, reporting by reporting about two and a half years of the experimental work that's been done on the gas loading experiments. So one more thing I want to say before I go into my presentation. If you find the results interesting, uh, if you want to know more about experimental studies on the cold fusion, please talk to Rick or talk to me. We would love to go into details because, as always, the devil is in the details. So anyway, I'm going to start my presentation with the brief overview of the history of the cold fusion. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the difference between uh, different experiments, the difference between electrolytic experiments and the diff in about the gas loading experiments. And that is what uh, I'm working on. Uh, you will see the experimental results. I will talk about the excess heat generation mechanisms, uh, the concept of fuel. And um, then I will just present my conclusions. So in 1989, uh, Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons ran the experiment. And the results of those experiments could not be explained from the conventional chemistry point of view. Their electrochemical cell generated more heat than it was provided with. So what is the electrochemical cell? Uh, it's a DUR with heavy water and electro as an electrolyte. And uh, the electrical current is supplied to it. So you can see the palladium cathode. Um, once again, the power they have supplied to this, to this cell um, actually was less than the excess heat they have observed and measured. Okay. You know what? Sorry, there's, there's a missing picture. <clears throat> uh, so you won't, you won't see the picture. I'll try to explain it in words. What I'm trying to say is, what is what in cold fusion? You see on those uh, things we really need to make the cold fusion work. So the isotopes, deuterium and hydrogen, what is the difference between, uh, between them? So hydrogen is a proton with the electron that goes around it. Deuterium is the same kind of hydrogen, but it has one additional thing. It's a nucleus. It has a neutron. So the isotope of hydrogen is deuterium, and the isotope of water, which is H2O, H2O would be a heavy water, D2O. So we need a source of uh, deuterium atoms to make a cold fusion happen. What those deuterium atoms are need for, they actually can fuse together and produce a new particle. Um, in this particular example, it's a helium particle, but there, there could be some other things. So new particle is produced, and also there is an energy released as a result of this nuclear fusion. So uh, we have our deuterium atoms, but they won't just fuse all of a sudden. We need a special environment for that fusion to happen. So we need this palladium metal. And most of the cold fusion experiments, um, successful replication, has been done with palladium. So uh, what do we measure? So we have a choice of measuring either particles that's been produced. And Rick talked about, for example, charged particles. Or we can look at the energy which, been, which um, has been released as a result of this um, reaction. And um, in, most, in most of the cold fusion experiments, usually people measure heat. So why do we even deviate from the original Fleischmann and Pond experiment, Pond's experiment? Why don't we just keep doing it and doing it and doing it? The thing is, and this is a major cold fusion problem 
the cold fusion science problem, it's really hard to replicate those experiments. So the replication rate was very low. And at some point, scientists have started looking for that one experiment that maybe not produce too much heat, but at least this is something that you can run every time, and every time we'll get the results. So if you can make something to work every time, then we can study it. And it seems like um, about seven years ago, this kind of experiment was found. And this is a gas loading experiment. And it was showing the consistent results every time you run it. So the, um, the results being reported by Japanese, uh, some replications done in Italy. Here in the United States, it was a naval research lab, did a very extensive study. And here in Boulder, we also uh, got positive, consistent replications. So that is the gas loading system I'm going to talk about. And this is the system. We have two of them. And um, they've been running 24-7 for the last two and a half years. So the system consists of the, um, we call it isothermal chamber or ov oven. And you can see those stainless steel vessels. That is something where we put our sample, our powders. And we can supply gas through the gas lines. It can be hydrogen, deuterium, argon, helium. So what we do is we cycle this gas. So the gas goes in, um, system is under the pressure, then we evacuate uh, the gas. So what we, look f what we are looking for is the change of the temperature. So if the net temperature change is positive, then we know that we have an excess heat. And uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's another picture missing. <clears throat> Um, and that is what goes in, in, the, uh, in the vessels. This is the powder I was talking about. It consists on, of the palladium nanoparticles, very small palladium particles. I'm not going to into details how we make these materials. Um, but it's, 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 not very, it's not very difficult. And it's a very well described procedure. And it's very well described by chemists because this is a perfect example of the catalytic material. It's a catalyst. So is that a coincidence that those successful replication of the cold fusion experiments being done with the material that's been studied for more than 100 years, which is a catalyst? I don't think so. What you see here is um, an explanation how palladium nanoparticle, palladium catalyst, can really promote a one very interesting chemical reaction. And the result of this chemical reaction can be the excess heat, not, not excess heat, and the thermic heat. This reaction called the HD exchange reaction. And what happens is deuterium exchanges with hydrogen, and it produces heat. It's not too much heat. But it's enough to explain those results that the other groups have been demonstrating, well, including us. So, and that's what people have been doing. They've been taking this material, giving it deuterium, and observe some, some heat. The thing about the HD exchange reaction that you can actually reverse it. And if you do this right way in the right environment, then you can make this reaction endothermic, and you will be absorbing heat. So instead of excess heating, you will see cooling. And then we thought that, OK, if we do it this way, if we find the right way to do it, and we can prove that we can show only, um, not only heating, but also cooling, that will prove that uh, the source of that excess heat or anomalous heat, it's actually chemistry. And there is nothing anomalous about it. So um, we ran that experiment in those special conditions. And um, the results, you can see them here. 
When we start with deuterium pressurization, we have the excess heat. Don't be fooled by these negative numbers. That is how chemists uh, describe the exothermic reaction. The enthalpy is negative. So even though those bars and each bar actually corresponding to the excess heat that been released um, during one cycle, so these bars are negative, but that means the system generates heat. And you can see the sequence of runs increasing and at the same time, the energy released by the system is decreasing. It seems like we have some fuel which we are using up. And then we switch the gas to hydrogen. And all of a sudden, we have the cooling. We have the endothermic reaction going. So we kind of proved, well, we proved the hypothesis, which I showed on the previous slide, which explained the HD exchange. So after some hydrogen pressurization, you can see the endothermic heat also goes away. So the cooling is going away. We switch it to hydrogen, and we uh, regenerate that heat back. Well, what does it mean? It means there is some fuel trapped in the material. And by alternating the gases, hydrogen and deuterium, we can actually engage the reactions, either exothermic or endothermic, the question is, what's the fuel? And the fuel is water. We introduce deuterium, we exchange it in water, then we, we, then we introduce hydrogen and exchange it in heavy water. So water is the source of that heat. And if the water is the fuel for this reaction, what if we remove it? What if we make our material totally, completely water-free? That will, that will mean, well, anyway, I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you. <laughs> Um, how do you get rid of water? Probably the most um, common way would be just to bake it. 100 degrees is not enough. 100 degrees won't make that powder water-free. We have to go higher. And we went up to 390 degrees. And then we cool down system. Everything is done in vacuum. We cool down system back to the room temperature. And we didn't see any excess heat, neither with hydrogen or deuterium, no heat, no cooling, nothing. So we got rid of water, we killed the reaction. We didn't stop there. We actually took the powder outside of the system, put it in the Petri dish, and put it on the scale, and just watched the weight increasing. And within um, 24 hours, it's actually gained 5%, and that 5% was water. That was a m moisture from the air, and even here in the dry Colorado, it was enough to make enough fuel for the, for the reaction because then we loaded this powder back to the system and ran hydrogen and deuterium and we saw that that excess heating and excess cooling came back. So we proved that the fuel was indeed a water. And it would be nice to kind of say, well, that's it, mystery solved. But there were some very interesting reports done by the other groups. They were saying that cons they consistently see something really unexplainable whenever they go to the higher temperatures. So as I said, most of our experiments been done at 40 degrees. But the people are saying, well, if you go to 180, if you go to 200, 400, then you start seeing something truly unexplainable. And Obviously, we just decided that we absolutely need to replicate those conditions and see what, what's happening. So we went to the higher temperatures, and yes, we've seen some unexplained heating and cooling at those elevated temperatures. So now I'm going to talk about more about measurement system and what kind of nasty tricks it can play with you and how you can be, well, you have to be aware of them and also you have to know how to overcome those, those measurement errors and, and difficulties. So the excess heat generation under gas pressure. So whenever we had a gas in the system, we saw that unexplained heat and the temperatures in our system had to be more than 250. That, that's when you see it. If you're below 250, there's nothing unusual going on. 
The interesting thing is it was the same uh, excess heat generation for uh, hydrogen and deuterium. There is no difference between hydrogen and deuterium. And it was lasting forever. As long as you have a gas, you have uh, your unexplained temperature change. And that, that, was, that was a little bit upsetting because that excess heat generation really depend on the vessel location inside the oven. You move your vessel back, I mean, you move it right or left a couple inches, and you have this effect, and then you lose this effect, or you enhance this effect. So it seemed like this is something, something about the system that produces this artifact. And what you see here is the picture of inside of the oven, inside of the system. So how do we actually go to those higher temperatures, 250 degrees? We have this oven, and there is a heater on the back panel of the oven, and there's a fan that actually blows the hot air in the oven. I have to say right away, this is a commercial system. It actually was built to keep the control temperature in the range of 10 millikelvins. So it is really good, but still not good enough. At the high temperature settings, this air flow is not that uniform anymore. And we have a temperature gradient across the oven. So we have some of the um, corners, let's say, of the oven hotter than another one. So we have a heat flow cr across, across the oven. How does it hurt us? Let's say we have those random hot or cold spots across the oven. Then if the hot spot is somewhere close to the vessel, in the absence of gas in the vacuum, our temperature sensor measures one temperature, T2, let's say, because some of the heat will be lost due to transfer. And when we bring the gas in, there is some convection. The gas is moving. Also, the gas has some thermal conductivity assigned to it, right? So it actually makes the coupling of the hot spot to this thermal temperature sensor much, much, much better. So we're channeling heat inside the vessel and the gas helping us to do this more efficiently. So now we me measure temperature T3, which is more than T2. And then we remove the gas, right? And we kind of kill this, this, this case. We go back to the initial uh, state. So our temperature will drop back to T2. So that's why whenever we have a gas, we measure temperature higher than it's supposed to be. So we decided to artificially recreate those thermal gradients by putting either resistive heater on the vessel or the cooling element. And um, we just dissipated heat or we, we cooled down the vessel, once again, intentional, intentionally. So that is the result of that experiment. Let's look at this first plot. That is when everything is in equilibrium. There is no temperature gradient in the oven. So what you see here is that is when the gas is in helium, and that's when the argon is in the system. So those tiny spikes corresponding to the gas flow into the system get compressed. You have heat, and then you pull it out, so you have some cooling. Um, totally, totally normal process. There is nothing here, nothing unusual. Now we turn on our tiny heater. So we call it a hot spot on the vessel. Um, I want to emphasize that it's not like we're turning on and off this heater. This heater is on all the time. What difference is only the presence of the gas, helium and argon. And you can see whenever the gas is in the system, this temperature is just jump, and uh, the baseline is shifted. So the shift is different for helium and argon simply because they have different uh, thermal conductivity. We have proved this mechanism is working also for the cold spot. So you can see this shift is downward. So yes, it has explained those um, results we've been um, seeing in our oven previously at the higher temperatures simply because it was non-uniform temperature environment. Why is it so important? Because, once again, people who work at the higher temperature settings 
they use uh, coil heaters, they use uh, heat sleeves. That's how they heat up their material. And if you do it non-uniformly, you will always, always be dealing with the temperature gradient which will cause this artifact. Um, I'm at the point of the conclusions. So what you have seen is not the result, well, I didn't show you any cold fusion, but what I showed you is the experiments that can actually help uh, the cold fusion researchers to evaluate the result of their experiment in the way they, um, they, ca they can really assess the chemical heat and they can, uh, and they can uh, I mean, they will be aware of the temperature gradient and if they test the system with the inert gas, they'll be able to rule out those temperature uh, gradient artifacts. So, and that is just a suggestion. It's, it's pretty vital for the cold fusion community to get those gas loading experiments reproduced in a way I just showed to rule out the chemistry and measurement artifacts. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? Yuri Kron. Olga, since we are at SEC meeting, we, uh, we can talk about some magical things. Like, uh, do you consider possibility that palladium energy participates in the process? Because catalysts, uh, like palladium and platinum, you cannot explain their activity without involvement of some kind of energy. What we did, we developed energy of platinum, infused it in the gasoline so that no other chemicals would participate, and exhaust diminished four times uh, carbon dioxide uh, in uh, that gasoline was diminishing four times carbon monoxide and almost eliminated hydrocarbons. So definitely energy participates in the chemical reactions. So is it possible that palladium energy also participates here? Okay. So I said, I, I mentioned that those catalysts have been studied for 100 years. The sad part is that even after those 100 years of extensive studies and extensive usage of those systems, the magic they're doing is still not explained. I'm, I'm not sure if I answered your question. <laughs> I mean, even the chemists, they can't explain it. They, no, they can't explain it fully. Uh, this is Rich. <clears throat> You'd mentioned the noble gases have different characteristics. Have you used other noble gases than the ones you've displayed? Uh, for this particular experiment, we used um, only helium and argon as noble gases. And we compared the results to the uh, hydrogen and deuterium pressurizations. And the thing is, between hydrogen, deuterium, and helium, their thermal conductivity is the same, virtually. So in the baseline shift I showed was the same for those three gases. So I would, ex I would expect if I use, let's say, xenon, was the thermal conductivity like none because it's the biggest, well, not the biggest, krypton is biggest. So that shift will be absolutely minimum. So that's why since cold fusion works with deuterium and hydrogen for this application, it's not just some inert gas they need to test their systems with. They need to test it with helium, which has the thermal conduct conduction coefficient the closest to the hydrogen and deuterium.